All right, so everybody, we're going to pull out our Bibles and we're going to go all the way to um, this here. Oh, I always forget to do this. You don't see my bookmarks. Don't look. They're very bad. Don't look at them. There we go. Actually, what happens if I do this? Ah, full Ooh. screen. Should have done that. Okay, so we're looking at 1 Timothy 3. And of course... You know, I took a bunch of notes here and did my full study between both chapters here. And as always, Stephen, if there's a place that I miss or you want to add, just cut me off and go ham. So we're going to start today in the verse one. And obviously, if you have your physical Bibles, you can read your physical Bibles or you can read what's on the screen. So it says, this is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. So I can already hear Serrano saying, what's a bishop? And a bishop is a leader. It's an overseer. And what I want to point out here is this part right here. It says desire a good work. It is considered work by God and by the church of God. So any sort of leadership position in the church of God especially as an overseer of sorts, which can include ministry and not just physical local church. It is a work. It is considered a work and not uh, a preferment uh, as it would have been considered later on by people that sort of departed from the word. It was always considered a work. Now, what we're going to look at here is the qualifications of a leader. So there are two different types of leaders in the Bible. Uh, of course, there are different roles, but there are two different sort of tiers. And the main tier would be, or the, the highest tier under Christ would be a bishop, a overseer. And then under that would be a deacon. Now, the Bible doesn't actually teach that there should be one pastor overruling everybody. In fact, the Bible teaches that there should be a presbytery, that there should be multiple deacons and perhaps multiple bishops who oversee and look over uh, either various churches or just the local church. And so there is a structure to it, but the requirements as you go up the ladder, so to speak, become even more uh, stringent and difficult to achieve. So we're going to look at that. It says a bishop then must be blameless. So this means that there can be nothing in their lives of unrighteousness that can be brought to their uh, account to say, hey, you've lied or you've done this thing or you're doing this thing. They must be blameless. So they must live their life with righteousness. And so this is something that, which is why not just anyone can be a leader or someone can't appoint themselves to be a leader. We'll find out a little bit more as we go, but they must be blameless. Now, this doesn't mean you have to be married because Paul wasn't married. Uh, but it does mean that if you are married, and unfortunately in this time, the Gentiles would have multiple wives. So they were instantly barred from being an overseer if you had multiple wives. Same thing if you were a Jew and you had multiple wives, concubines, whatever, barred from leadership. So you have to only have one wife. And then you yourself must be vigilant. So you must be on the watch. You must be looking for things. You must be investigating things and making sure others aren't getting into trouble and you, you have to be vigilant and the requirement of being vigilant is also being sober so this is not just not doing drugs or not doing alcohol but also sober in the sense that you're not just letting your mind you know sort of uh drift here and there and you're kind of living life lackadaisically doing whatever you want you must be sober you must be a watchful and thinking and, and aware of what's going on around you. And then it says of good behavior. So being genial and nice and kind and all these things that are required of being a leader given to hospitality, meaning that you should be wanting and able to help others in the greatest capacity that you can. And then another thing here is apt to teach. So that means that you have the ability at any point in time to teach what the word of God says. And it goes on. So this is this is just the beginning. You can't be given to wine as a uh, leader. That means uh, you, you can't be a drinker. 
You can't be somebody that just casually drinks or drinks for fun or drinks every weekend. You, that's your barred from leadership if that's who you are. You cannot be given to it. You cannot have it as a part of your life. Does it mean you can never have a glass of wine or never have a beer? No. It just simply means that if it's a custom in your life, barred. You're barred from from being able to, not forever. I mean, of course, if you were to give that up and you were to follow this, then you could be, perhaps if God called you, a bishop or a leader. But if you are a leader and this is in your life, you're instantly barred. So this part right here, and anything, Stephen, or am I good? So if I, okay. you know, the just the first line, there is a lot of mention in like modern churches that you shouldn't be desiring a position of leadership because hmm. they don't want you to cause contention or strife or like there's all this talk about competition and it's like ah, yep. it, it's just a wrong view it's more of like they're trying to protect their position hmm. than they are yep. it says right here it's a good thing if somebody desires that you desire good work and it said you know you sh it's, it says if you desire it, you desire a good thing like desire good work you should desire it mm -hmm. like these standards are standards you should be aiming for and shooting for. Yeah. These are like obtainable things that a righteous man of God would be living like. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So a lot of churches will just be like almost against the idea of people desiring uh, leadership roles. Right. That's and that's right. wrong. If the church was church. growing, right. If the church was growing properly, well, of course you would need new, new men to stand up and to be, brought up in righteousness and to be taking new positions because you would be expanding at that rate. Yeah. But now they want one deacon for every hundred people for no random reason. And you know, if they don't change, just keep getting revoted in, revoted in, revoted in. It's like a broken system. Mm -hmm. Anyway. Yeah. More on that on a new podcast called the upside down church. <laughs> maybe <laughs> there's no, there's no plan for that really, but we'll see. Maybe. Definitely going to talk about it at some point. Okay, so no striker. So this means you don't hit people. It's pretty simple. Don't hit people. Don't hit things. You're not striking. Yeah. You're not a violent person. It says brawler in other verses, like someone who's apt yeah, to always says, want to fight or fist fight. It's right here, too. Oh, yeah. There so it, is. it says not, not greedy, a filthy liqueur. So this is somebody that's uh, through uh, lying or other sort of ways, trying to get more money, always seeking money, always trying to get richer, uh, always seeking, you know, oh, I can get rich if I do this, and and being greedy and desiring these things, these filthy, filthy liqueur. I want to get rich quick, all this kind of stuff, being greedy. Um, but instead of those things, instead of being a striker and greedy and given to wine, you are to be patient and, like Stephen said, not a brawler, nor covetous. You know, this is one of the ones that we often skip over in evangelism where we'll say, you know, have you ever lied? Have you ever stolen? Have you ever taken the Lord's name in vain? Have you ever looked with lust? Have you ever committed uh, adultery? Have you ever fornicated? We ask all these various questions, but we almost always skip over coveting. But coveting is actually in the Ten Commandments. And the other day, maybe about a month ago, I was reading through the Ten Commandments and I was going, that one hit me. I'm like, you know what? I think this one is important. I think the reason why we don't go over it is because it's so commonplace that people won't even feel any response to it. But did you know that you are not to covet? And to covet means to desire something that is not yours and that you have no right to. So another man's wife, another man's donkey, another man's car, another man's house, whatever. I, I love what Paul says about that. That if it wasn't for the law, he wouldn't have known covetousness. Yeah, right. Because it's like not naturally. Because we're naturally evil, we naturally want other people's things. So unless it was by God's law revealing it to him, yeah. he wouldn't have known his covetousness was yep. so wicked. Amen. Yep. Yep. That's it's hard. It's hard does. not to covet, man. That's probably the number one broken one. Mm hmm. Yep. I would say the only one that can compete and probably does happens more often is taking the Lord's name in vain, which is even worse. So here we go. We're still going into the breakdown of what a leader uh, needs to have. Look at this. One that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. So this means that you cannot have someone in leadership with their children being completely disobedient, 
and not listening to the Father. He has no control. And here, here's why. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, if he can't even figure out how to be a good father and rule his house like he ought to, the way that God has commanded him to, how shall he not rule, notice, rule the house, but not the church, how shall he take care of the church of God? So if he can't even figure out how to be a good father, how to direct his children, etc., etc., how can he take care of the church of God? He can't. Here's something that, you know, is very important. Not a novice. This is not just um, somebody who's recently saved, but also someone who's a novice in the doctrines, novice in the faith. So he doesn't really know a lot about uh, the correct doctrines. Well, then he would be considered a novice. And if you put him in a position of leadership like this, he'll be lifted up and with his pride, he shall fall into the condemnation of the devil. That condemnation, Satan will use someone's pride because pride is the thing that caused even the angels to fall. Pride is the thing that the pride and selfishness is the thing that caused Eve to eat of the, oh, I can be like God. Oh, I want. And so she had pride and almost always pride uh, before or after, to, uh, af before pride, what am I saying? Proverbs, whatever. If you have pride, destruction will come. And so pride is the thing that we pray for actually quite often that the Lord would remove our pride, that he would show us our sins, that he would show us where we are doing things wrong because it is in that pride that you're going to fall and that the devil is going to take advantage of that. And this is what it says down here as well. It says, moreover, he must have uh, a, a good report of them that are which uh, without. So these are uh, people in your community that are not saved who say or think well of you to some degree. So you're kind, you're the way you, you, your conversation of your life, as the Bible would put it, is good. And so other people say, have good things to say about you. They say, oh, Stephen, you know, he's such a hardworking man. Oh, Stephen, you know, he's, he's, he's so well planned with everything he does and everything he executes. Is, and they have all these wonderful things to say of him, right? It, but they're not saved. And so he has a good report of them that are without. He's qualified by that of course, everything else as well, to be a leader. And the problem is, if you don't have that, you will fall, that Satan will use that as well. as Because it says, lest he sh uh, fall into reproach and snare of the devil. So the devil will use that against you and against the church and against everything else. So we are to be, um, there's another verse, I think we studied it last time, where it says that we are to pray for our leaders so that we can have good and honest lives and do what's right. And so this is what it's talking about, that we can have that and do that. And then we're not going to fall into the reproach and snare of the devil. So now it now it shifts into deacons. This doesn't mean that it excludes these things that uh, are for uh, leaders, because this is sort of like leaders should be doing this anyways. Bishops should be doing this anyways. But now it sort of focuses more on the deacons. And so these are the requirements for the deacons. And by the way, this entire chapter is telling you how to do church, at least from the polity perspective when the word polity simply means the way that the church is structured with leadership and everything and so it says likewise the deacons must be grave not double-tongued not and so this is saying one thing but doing another or saying one thing to one person and saying another thing to another person you know you're lying that way so i skipped over grave but this word grave by the way means solemn it means to not be joking around about everything but to be serious especially of the things of God. doesn't mean that you can't have a laugh here and there. That's fine. It's talking about that you take life and you take the things of God seriously. You're grave. You're not, not everything is a joke to you. You can't be double-tongued. Again, you can't be given to much wine. You cannot be greedy, a filthy liqueur. You must hold the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience, in a pure mind, not a doubled mind, in a pure mind. And this is sort of like, you know, the doctrines, the mystery of the faith is like the doctrines <clears throat> and uh, evangelism. Go ahead. I just, the double tongue thing, man, that's like one of the biggest things I see currently mm. is people being double tongued. Especially, even people in these so called positions. Mm. Yeah. And I think it has to do with obviously they're not qualified if they're doing that. Mm -hmm. yeah. But at the, at the same time, like, 
why are they double tongued? Because they're pleasers of men. Yeah. And they're not just trying to please God. Because if they were, they could just speak the truth. Yeah. Yeah, and this is how we know, you know, who is truly a deacon. And so a lot of people are like, well, I have a church and I have a building and we got money and therefore I am, I am sort of, uh, my position is ordained of by God. And it's like, no, it's actually ordained through the spiritual realm and not by the providence of man. So just because you go to college or whatever and people vote you onto a board as an elder or whatever, you get voted on as a, quote, pastor or the, you know, the the head pastor, which is blasphemous in itself because there's only one head pastor, the Bible says, and that's Jesus. We, we can do the role of pastoring, but we're not pastors in the sense that it's a title. That's something maybe for another time. But uh, God is the one who ordains people, not it, just like he did with the fishermen. It, he didn't go to the Pharisees who were all trained up, did he? He went to those who uh, probably existed in some way a lot better in the conversation of their life than did the Pharisees who were sort of double-tongued and everything. So it's just a reminder that just because someone has a earthly position of authority doesn't mean they have a heavenly position of authority. And if they're doing these things, they are disqualified. They are not deacons. They are not leaders not in the kid doesn't mean that if you make a, a mistake that you're instantly disqualified forever people make mistakes here and there and that's where the church is supposed to you know we're supposed to confess our faults and that we're supposed to uh uh be repent from those things and turn away from them but if we repent from something and we continually go back into it then you didn't repent in the first place so a little bit more on that maybe later um when me and steven cover this a little bit deeper but um, let's go to where were we uh, 10 and let these, this is something very interesting. It says, and let these, the deacons and leaders also first be proved. They must be tested. So you test them, their words, their doctrine and their life. Then let them use the office of a deacon being found blameless. So they must be found blameless first. You must be able to. Uh, and I think this is a mistake we made originally when we were starting mm -hmm. leadership certain people. is we didn't, you know, right, with certain people, we didn't make sure beyond a shadow, we didn't test them. And that's to our own, you know, the, the, the suffering that we went through before having leaders that weren't really supposed to be leaders was our fault. And it was because we were young in the faith, to be honest. Um, but, you know, when you bring someone in to be in an office of a deacon, they must be be found blameless. This is another reason why you can't do church online, because how can you test someone's life based on their word alone? Like, sure, if the person's honest, but I guarantee you there are things that are only found out between a uh, real life conversation, seeing that person's life. Now, in the ministry, especially in a digital ministry, obviously it's important to address this. Um, it's not as uh, cut and dry that this is really this is for a church and ministry is a little bit different but we still follow the Bi the bible's guideline meaning w I don't, we don't have a church video game gospel is not a church uh and it never will be if we had a church in real life it would be in real life with real people and it would be certainly not called video game gospel it'd be called whatever it's called if it has a name at all really it'd be just people meeting and doing the things that the lord has called us to do um so there's a little bit of a difference between whether or not, um, uh, I wouldn't say if all these things apply, but it, it's it's different in how it functions because it's not a church. Does that make sense? Or Stephen, maybe elaborate. Um, I think the leadership, like leadership qualities apply across the board for any sort of Christian leader. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, to Chris's point, there are certain things, you know, like certain disciplinary church things or certain certain types of church things that just can't be done in this type of setting. Yeah. But that doesn't mean that we're not hold to these standards. In yeah. fact, we've lost people in leadership who weren't able to hold these standards. Yep. And we felt grieved that they weren't. And yeah. we try to correct it. We try to go about the correct way and everything, but yeah. they need to be proven first. Yeah. Even so, must their wives be grave? 
not slanderers, sober, and faithful in all things. So, you know, recently we were talking to somebody and the accusation put towards me was I was slandering because I was calling out something that was sin in someone's life. And it's like, that's not slandering. The biblical definition of slandering is to uh, say falsehoods about someone, to gossip. Oh, you, you know, Stephen, you know, he, he, did you know he eats tadpoles or some whatever, something stupid? You know, that would be slandering because it's not true. And I'm, I'm saying a falsehood. Uh, obviously, I don't actually mean that. I'm not actually saying a falsehood because I know he doesn't, but uh, that's what slandering would be. And so their wives, the wives, so it's not just, by the way, it's not just the husband that has to be doing the right stuff. It's the wives also. So the the the, the um, requirements shrink even further to who is allowed to be in a place of leadership. And so if you see someone on, let's say, uh, a deacon team in a church, but their wives are just completely out of control, slandering, they're not sober, they're not faithful in all things, they are disqualified because of their wife. So they have to be equally yoked. Is what you're saying? Yeah, the I think wife. that's a lot to do with the one flesh, right? You are yeah. a part of your wife. Your wife's a part of you, so yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I agree. Okay, where are we? Um, like twelve. Twelve, right? Let the deacons be the husband of one wife, same as a leader. I mean, there are leader of sorts, but ruling their children and their own house as well. For they that have used the office of a deacon the work, the job of a deacon, well purchased to themselves a good degree and a great and great boldness in the faith, which is in Christ Jesus. It is a wonderful thing mm. to have the position of a deacon. It is not something you should take lightly. It's not something that when you're rebuked, you know, four times in a row, you continue to do the same stuff. Like you should, it, you are purchasing to yourself a good degree and to lose that is a massive shame. For any Christian, a massive shame, and so uh, there, there's a part of Christianity that you have to do work. It actually mentions that a little bit further on, that or at least it implies that there's choice involved in the second chapter. These things write I unto thee, hoping to come unto you shortly. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know that thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God. Thus, he is now saying that this sort of section is this is how you are to do church. This is how we are to behave in the house of God. And later he says, this is this is a command. This is not optional. This is how we're to do it. So really, in all honesty, if churches aren't doing this, they are living against the command of the Bible. That's something to consider because we're talking about 99.9% .9 of churches, if not more. And it's uh, concerning. Which is the church of the living God in the pillar of the ground of truth. Now, I've seen this used in a local church that I was going to, to almost imply that the church is the ground of truth, almost as though it's the ground of tr truth outside of the Bible, is how it All was right. kind of worded. And what this is saying is that the church is the ground of truth through Jesus Christ, through the word, not through their own interpretation, but through the word and through the doctrines which have been implied. And it is the church that is that pillar and ground of truth on the earth. If the church disappears, so does the giving of truth. Before there will be no more mouths of, of at least human origin uh, to speak these things except the word of God. So if the word of God were to disappear and humans were to disappear, there would be no more pillar in the ground of truth. And really, without the word of God, we have no ground of truth. So it is through the word of God, uh, by the Holy Spirit, into the churches and into the people in those churches, that is the pillar and the ground truth. That's what it's saying. It's not saying that the church has the right to, you know, we know truth and we only us, you know, so truth, this how, excuse me, this is how churches become cult like. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. This is something I love. I want to show you something. Didn't plan on it, but I want to show you something. It's very, very important. So let's look at this. This is the uh, new pukey version, and this is not the Bible, but it says, Beyond all question, the mystery from which true godliness springs is great. He appeared in the flesh. He 
Now, Jehovah's Witnesses have loved to use this to make it clear that Jesus was not God. But look at what the King James does. It says, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God, theos, is the word used here. God, theos. Not he. Not he. Theos. Because he what? He an angel? He brother, the brother of Lucifer, according to Mormons? No. God. God. The God of the universe was manifested in the flesh. Then he was justified in the spirit by the Holy Spirit. He was seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up into glory. It was God that came to us and died on that tree. It certainly was not anything else but God. Mm -hmm. And so this is why, one of the many reasons why, they take this out in other Bibles. Why? Mm -hmm. Why? 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 What is the yeah. what is the good reason? There is no. It, it no always good attacks reason. the deity of Christ. Yeah, right. Always, I mean, mostly, but the all these verses. Oh, there's no doctrinal change. Excuse me, changing he from God. Why would you possibly want to change that to give room to Satan, unless you're serving him? So very very important verse. Uh, one of the reasons why we are King James. Man, only. that's just that's so crazy, man. That's. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I feel bad for people who just keep reading that. Yeah, well, that's that's one among. <laughs> yeah, amen. Amen. <laughs> I mean, that's one one among thousands of other problems with Bibles, other Bibles out there, and it just goes on and on and on. You know, it's not just a different translation. It's it is it is not the Word of God. It is tampered with and adulterated. So now we're going into First Timothy four. This is a great chapter. It's one of my favorite chapters. Actually, both of these are one of my favorite chapters of First Timothy. And it says, now the spirit speaketh expressly. So this is very important, he says. This is the spirit speaking very this very clear. In the latter times, the times that we're living in, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits. So seducing like uh, doc, basically demons and doctrines of devils. Speaking lies in hypocrisy. They're hypocritical and they say things that don't even make sense. They're lying on everything, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. I want you to notice the Catholic Church in this line right here. Forbidding to marry. What do they command their priests not to do? They're not allowed to marry, right? We just read that they must be a husband of one wife. So what's going on there? Forbidding to marry, right? And we see this, I think Stephen said in the Seven-day Adventists, although I don't know a lot about them, commanding to abstain from meats. Right, Stephen? Yep. Right. So he's saying, that's how we know, by the way, we're in the latter times, because we see these two things already. Which God hath created to be received. What did he create? Meats. Okay. Which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them that believe and know the truth. Okay, so the meat, meat is not bad. We are, it is supposed to be received with thanksgiving unto the Lord of them, us, which believe and know the truth, us. For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. Look at this, for it is sanctified by the word of God in prayer. So what does that mean? How does the word of God sanctify um, food? Well, if you look at... Um, Peter's vision here. So he's he's very hungry. He says, and he became very hungry. So he's sitting on a rooftop, if, as far as I remember. Yeah, house stopped to pray at this about the sixth hour. He became very hungry and would have eaten, but while they made ready the food, he fell into a trance. Oh, you, you, you. He fell into a trance, and of course he didn't make that noise, but he fell into some sort of trance, and saw heaven opened and a certain vessel descending unto him, as it had been a great sheet knit at the four corners and let down to the earth, wherein all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth and wild beasts and creeping things and fowls of the air. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. And Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is uncommon, <laughs> that is common or unclean. I, arguing with the Lord. What are you doing, Peter? <laughs> He does it three times. He does it three times. This Peter is like the guy of mistakes. That's what he is. But whose voice was that? The Lord's in his oh. vision. The voice came oh. to him. Rise, oh, yeah. Peter, kill him. Peter argue with God like three times? Yeah, listen, he does it right now. Yeah. Three times he denied 
Jesus three times. Three times he also said, said he loved the Lord, and three times he yeah, denied him again. Exactly. What? So it says, mind blowing. And Peter yeah. said, "Not so, Lord. I've never eaten common and clean." And then the voice spake unto him again the second time, "What God hath cleansed, thou call not thou common, you." <laughs> you know, like God has cleansed it. Why are you saying against it? This was done thrice, and the vessel was received up to heaven again. It's like Peter needed to be convinced three times every single time. So this is what that's about. Uh, Acts 10, if you want to read more into that. But um, so this is what it's saying. When it's sanctified by the word of God and prayer, we know that all meat has been given everything. You can eat anything and everything basically now, although there was sort of like uh, dietary laws for uh, the Jews at some point. Um, now God has made everything and everything. And it, how is it sanctified? By the word. And that's why we pray every time we eat. Because it tells us right here, sanctified by the word. We just read it. And a word of God. And it's also by our prayer. So we say, thank you, Father, for the food you've given us. I uh, pray it's, you know, one of the things my family would pray. My mom would always say, is it blessed to the good of our body? You know, she'd mm -hmm. say. It's like one of those things that's that similar. Christians say all the time is blessed to the good of our body. Yeah, you should be praying before you eat. I'm going to be honest. I don't always do that. I just forget <laughs> because I'm not with other people. But I guarantee you, if I was with other people, I'd be praying. And when I am with other people, I do pray. It's one of those things where you're by yourself, you're like, nom, nom, nom. <laughs> you know, you don't think about it. Okay, so now look at this. It says, if thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, what things? Well, you got to remember that these chapters were added beforehand. So these chapters weren't here. So everyone thinks, okay, that's the closing of the thought, just because there's a chapter there. And it's like, no, he's saying all these things. Put in the remembrance of these things, which I've told you, that... There will be some in latter times that will depart from the faith and give heed to doctrine of devils. He says, if you do this and everything else I've told you in this letter, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained. Attained from what? From all the teaching that he has been given and all the epistles. And, and so what he's saying is that by necessarily, by watching out for the doctrines of devils, you are going to be nourished up in the words of the faith and the word of God. And thus, you're going to be able to discern uh, what is good and what is bad doctrine. And uh, you'll be nourished up in the faith and that will make you a good minister of Jesus Christ. And, and it starts with really recognizing that there are doctrines of devils. There's so many Christians like, well, what do you mean he's a false teacher? What do you mean? The doctrines of devils don't exist. I say, I'm sorry, but it says in latter times, the times we know we're living in because of the forbidding to marry and the commanding to abstain from meats, that uh, that we need to be watching out for doctrines of devils. And by the way, this was written about the Catholic Church here and perhaps Seventh-day Adventists here, but it's not limited to that. The doctrines of devils are just pouring out now. There's just, there's everywhere. They're just, you know, there's this heresy there, that heresy there, this online church there, online baptisms there. <laughs> um, you name it, there's a doctrine for it, oh. and it's doctrines of devils. Word of faith is a good example. Then it says, but refuse profane and old wives fables, old wives tales. Refuse that. Get rid of it. Don't pay attention to it. Don't entertain it. And exercise thy, thyself rather unto godliness. Look at this. For bodily exercise, working out, profiteth little. It does very little for anything in the long run. But godliness is profitable unto all things. Having promise of the life that is now and of that which is to come. So a life that is to come. This So our godliness is not just for now. It's not just do it because God said or else. It's we're doing it for now. And also for the life to come. We, do, we don't just... A lot of people are like, oh, I'm saved, that's good, I'm out. You know, easy believers will do that. And it's like, no, we are to exercise, work out. Again, remember I said earlier there would be like a portion of this that talks about choice. When you exercise, you make a choice to do something hard in the now that profits you later. And he's comparing it to, look, you can be Arnold Schwarzenegger, but it's a little, little profit. What is profitable, though, for here... And later is godliness. And he says, This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. For therefore we labor and suffer reproach. What? For exercising and becoming godly, we labor in that and then we suffer reproach. Because we trust in the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. So God's offer of salvation, this is a, I wrote it in the anti Calvinist verse section up there. 
he is the savior of all men. He, he, everyone can be saved through Jesus Christ. It's not just the vessels of mercy and the vessels of wrath too bad. If they wanted to, they could be vessels of mercy. In fact, there's even a section in the Old Testament where it talks about, you know, if they do this, then they won't be considered vessels of uh, wrath anymore. They'll turn and repent and believe on the Lord. And so this is saying um, that God because we trust in the living God, who is the savior of all men, but especially of those that believe. Those that believe are the ones that are, uh, who is the savior, but he's also the savior of everyone else. They just need to repent and believe. Then it says, these things command and teach. These are not optional. These are not, right. um, maybe I'll do it. It's a command from the living God. Through the Apostle Paul. Then it goes on to give some encouragement to Timothy, and it says, Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers. Because Timothy is essentially an overseer, he's a bishop. And he says, Be an example for the other believers. In word, what you say. In conversation, what you do. In charity, how you do it. Like your love to other people and how you treat people. In spirit, what's, or do you just do these things outwardly? Or in your spirit, does it match the same? Are you in the word, in conversation, and in, in charity doing all the loving things, but inwardly you're angry and bitter? No. In spirit, you must also be an example. In your faith. So when you, you're suffering and you don't have a lot or whatever, and the Lord is allowing you to suffer, you can show through your faith to other believers, this is how you have faith. And then you should be pure. It's a tall order. But it's what we all should really be trying to attain. Then he says, Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Give attendance to reading the word of God, to exhorting other people, and to doctrine. Doctrine is important, ladies and gentlemen. Neglect not the gift that is in thee, he's talking to Timothy now, which was given thee by prophecy with the laying on of hands of the presbytery. The presbytery. And this was time when prophecy was a, a big thing. This was before the gifts had, um, well, we're soft cessationists, but I don't want to go into that. Yeah, the gifts had have generally faded. And then he says, look at this. So the world says, oh, meditate in the morning and meditate at night and empty your mind. The Bible says the opposite about meditation. It says, fill your mind with the things mm -hmm. of God. Meditate mm -hmm. upon these things. Yeah, praise God. Give thyself wholly to them. There's another example of a choice. Give this is another example of free will, another example against Calvinism. We have a choice. Meditate is command. There's no point in having commands unless they're choices. Meditate upon these things. Give thyself wholly to them, that thy profiting may appear to all. This is this coincides with the verse that says that let your good works be seen of men so they may glorify your father in heaven. That's what's saying that they may profit, that thy profiting may appear to all. Take heed unto yourself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them. Now this verse has been misused, and I'm going to explain it to you. For in doing this, thou shalt save both, uh, thou shalt both save thyself and then that hear thee. Ah, see, Catholics will be like, this is how we save others by our good works. See, it says we're saved by our good works. This is saying saving from destruction, not saving from hell and damnation and away from sin, but saving yourself from being deluded and falling into heresy and everything I just talked about, the doctrines of demons and all stuff. You save yourself from that by what? By meditating by teaching these things, by exhorting, by uh, uh, doing all these living godly. This is how we keep ourselves from that. You'll notice that people that are in that, they don't have all these things that we just read. And they're often f failing in those ministry requirements because they're not doing this stuff. And so this is, this is important for Christians, but it's also super important for uh, leaders. It, mm -hmm. Being a leader is much harder, but... It is a good work, and it is something that we purchase for ourselves a good degree in the faith. So that's First Timothy 3 and 4. If I miss anything, Stephen? Dude, I just enjoyed it, man. So good. I love this book. Man, I wish I could just, we could just finish this right now. <laughs> yeah. You grab it piece of paper here and we'll do prayer requests soon but yeah i mean god's word is amazing and every time we read it you know we're we're, we're profited by it and you know 
Yeah, it's important too to meditate on it, like the word said. Yeah, right. I mean, sometimes we can want to consume it so fast that we will overlook things when we don't think yep. upon those certain things. So, yep, it is, it is good to go back, reread, re-listen, yep, rethink about these things, and not just power through it to get through it. Not saying that's the impulse. Obviously, it's not what I'm saying anybody wants to do, but. Well, it's something that often young believers do is they just want to read it. Yeah. You know? I want to finish the Bible. I want to finish the Bible. I want to finish the Bible. It's like, it's like well, well, meditate take it on in. it. You know, one of the, the downsides of an audio book is I find they just go through it so quickly. And you don't yeah. you don't have time to actually think about each verse and to study each verse. If you take your time through these, like I, I started, and this is no boast, but I started like around 5.30 to study this and of course I was doing other things but it took me like about a good hour and a half to study through these two chapters and I feel like I could have I feel like if I because I felt rushed because of time I could have spent two hours or three hours just in these two chapters because yeah. there's the word of God is so deep there's so much that you can gain from every single piece of it and so don't just rush through it because that's what I did when I was a young Christian dude just read it to read it Read it to understand it. Ask the Lord for wisdom and understanding. Take your time in reading the word. And the more you read, the more things will make sense to you. Like at first, maybe certain chapters, you're like, yeah, I don't even understand what they're talking about. I, I, what is, what, who cares? Who, I read Acts was the worst for me at first because I was like, I don't care about <laughs> any of this. Like, this is just a bunch of details. Like, where's the good stuff? But now I read Acts. I'm like, wow, whoa, we, there's all this stuff in here. <laughs> But that was because I wasn't, I didn't, you know, I didn't, I had no reference to like understand it. There's no easy way through that. Like these are, these, these times that we have are designed to help you guys go through, through that. The videos that we make, these turn into videos. The reason why we do that is so that you can go back through it and have uh, hopefully some better understanding. But if you don't do the work yourself, if you're not reading your Bible, you'll never get to that point where you're able to understand it. Me and Stephen didn't, didn't just wake up and all of a sudden we understood the word of God. Definitely there was like, before you're saved, you can't really understand it. And then when you are saved, you begin to understand it. But it took time and it, it will take you time. You just need to simply read it, be consistent with it. And as you read more and more and more, the Lord will reveal things to you. You'll kind of like take, you'll take a, like you're climbing up a ladder or something or a stairs or, or whatever you get. As you read more and more and more, it's like, it's really, it is like he says, exercise. Like if I, if I were to... <clears throat> start, I don't know, when I first started walking, right? Uh, like regularly every day, I walk like, I don't know, like half an hour. And I was like, okay, yeah. that's good. But then I ended up getting to like an hour, an hour and a half pretty easily. And so it's kind of like that with the word of God too, except there is no limit. Like there is with physical, you can just keep growing and growing in the word of God. So uh, quick question. I think maybe you guys already covered this word before, but when they say office, does that mean like space or what does that mean? When they say that, you mean when it says uh, that they the, they get the a, office of like the office. Yeah, so of you're thinking bishops, it means like yeah. an actual office building? No, not like an actual office, but like like the space around them, or like or the, in a room, I suppose. Or what are they? No, it means a job. It means the office. Oh, they just mean the job title. Oh. The um the position. Oh, bishop. like the role. Oh, the, the role. role of, right. Right. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. gotcha. So not nothing to do with physical space, but no, know, no, no. That's yeah. what I thought. I, I, yeah, I figured like it was an actual space office. I just thought maybe it was like a certain chamber or something. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. No, the second one that you said is true. <clears throat> okay, gotcha. So any more questions? Uh, I'll see you guys uh, tomorrow. I put in a prayer request in the uh, chat box. So. All right. I'm still recovering from sickness, so you know, I want to get a good night's rest. So, see you guys. Good night, okay. buddy. See you, Serrano. You too. See you, buddy. See ya. I, it's me, Vanna, but it's me, Vanna. Um, I'm sorry for coming in late. It was because of my mom's birthday, and I was trying to make it special for her. So Happy birthday, Mama Vanna. <laughs> Happy birthday to her. I'm like, Happy I only birthday. use, like, I only use like the audio books if I don't understand something. Cause even when I when I read it out loud, I I still don't get it. So I'm like, if somebody else 
reads it. Yeah, Maybe I know what I you mean. Because the one I have, the one I have, it like reads a little slower and it like emphasizes some of the words. Mm-hmm. And then I play it over and over to understand it. And I'm like, oh, and yeah. I don't read it to just read it. I generally like want to understand like what these people in the Bible will be trying to say to us, say to everybody else right. in their current situation and stuff. Mm-hmm. So should yeah. I just keep doing that or should I? Yeah. Do, I mean, I whatever helps wrong? you understand, so, obviously, like another good thing too, is like commentaries that you can get, like you can just get them. If you go to blue letter or whatever it is, you know, you can hit the commentaries thing and sometimes you can read, uh, what other people are saying. And that sometimes helps too, because you're like, Oh, now I understand what they're <laughs> saying or what they're talking about. I mean, I had to do that a lot too yeah. in the beginning, so nothing wrong with that. Yeah. Cause when I get like different perspectives on it, it helps you understand it better too. Yeah. So that, that was all I got so far. Hmm. Well, thank you for sharing. So, Josh, what do you got? You got any prayers? Come back to me later. Let me just... I, yeah. I'm just trying to remember. Okay. I'm writing down Serrano's prayer here. Steven? Hmm. Grant? Baby? Yeah. Wife. Wife. Okay. Oh, and like church relationships. If you want to call it that, whatever. Hmm. Okay. Um. Me? Oh. Just booking some of those jobs, I think, would be mm-hmm. good. That I've been auditioning for. And that I don't sort of burn out. Been putting in a lot of auditions. So, we'll see. I pray that, um, like, well, I don't pray. I ask, like, as a request to stay focused and to not be distracted. Because I get so distracted easily. So much stuff. And like I want to stay focused for mm-hmm. more reasons than one, but mainly for God and stuff, so I can do what He wants me to do, not what I want to. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Now, Vanessa, do you have anything you want prayer for? If you're awake, wake up. <laughs> Wake up! Family? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Oh, she was up. <laughs> that girl has the worst sleep schedule of literally anybody in our <laughs> Discord. Yeah, that's not that, that was bad. I was, I was like that at one point, too. Just thinking yeah. it was too late. Yeah. Alright. Alright, sure. I got something. Yeah. Just... Oh, love... uh, yeah, just pray that uh, when I get these tracks and I hand these out, in my community that uh that these were truly uh that, they, that these tracks can truly uh uh save someone and you know and uh, you know that it it helps them repent and and put their trust in christ and certainly pray god to use them yeah, yeah. and you now uh, yeah okay um let me close out the Bible study here. Or the recording. <laughs>